I'm a stone sculptor. I work mostly with granite, using the traditional tools of the trade, the hammer and the chisel. It's an ancient motion, one of mankind's first, and unchanged since we started to alter our world around us. When I make this motion, I can feel the muscle memory in my body. It resonates beyond this time, beyond the present. And after decades of carving, I still experience that sense of timelessness each time I pick up the tools. I measure my sculpture progress in seasons and years. The work takes real time. Stone is hard and the process is physical. It's slow and can sometimes feel grinding. But rather than be discouraged by the slow progress I seem to be making, I have come to relish the iterative empirical process it requires. Slowing down and turning inward has helped talk me out of any number of bad ideas. It's given me time to ask the hard questions, sometimes waiting years for the answer. It's also given me courage to tackle the big themes and work on them over long arcs of time. David Brooks, in his book, Road to Character, says that one should always have a permanent commitment to tasks that cannot be completed in a single lifetime. A single lifetime seems about right, since stone reminds me every day through its resistance and its unyielding permanence that the things worth doing take real time. Let me offer a few examples. This sculpture contains 550 tons of granite. That's the equivalent weight of 250 small trucks. It's one of four forms that divide the rooms of a large residence. Some of the blocks measure nine feet by 12 feet. That's the scale of an apartment bedroom. <laughs> this took four years to hand carve and install. One of my latest works, the Resolute Arch, took eight years to solve the engineering, build the prototype, and hand carve the granite. This work is on a civic scale, and one could easily drive a fire truck under it. When the stone carvers built the great cathedrals of Europe, it was not uncommon to spend 20 years on the foundation. Imagine spending your entire working life on a foundation that no one will ever see. Talk about delayed gratification. Masons spent their entire working lives on these projects over hundreds of years. Meaning and life purpose arose naturally from slow, sustained contribution, from the rush of setting a single stone into what I call a position of certainty. Once placed properly, stone stays put, maybe for a millennium, maybe forever. The fact that the task was hard, took real time and effort, is certainly part of it. But there's also something about leaving the world a little better, a little more beautiful than when I found it. Whatever it is, I feel that I'm part of that sustained contribution each time I finish a sculpture and place it on the ground. These days, we often look to technology to save us time. Technology seems to offer us shortcuts or life hacks. I am often asked, why do you still carve by hand when we can cut by computer or scan and squirt in 3D? Indeed, why talk to a person when I can text or simply swipe and like? Working in stone has made the reasons crystal clear to me. If I have done my work as an artist, over the decades, I have built thick neurologic cables between my heart and my hands. Using these simple ancient tools, what I feel is conveyed directly into my carving. 
In my hands, the hammer and chisel offer me an unmediated connection. There's nothing standing between what I feel and the material. With modern technologies, I'm, I'm several steps removed from the work. They can offer me a type of translation. But in the end, technology cannot transmit the human soul. This immediacy, this unmediated connection, is at the center of the great mystery, the magic of how some artworks affect and stir us. <laughs> My family jokes that I still carve with the hammer and chisel because I just want to do everything the hardest way possible. But what I've discovered is that when I tackle hard and difficult things, two important things happen. First, my body adapts and hardens for the task. How many of you have gone camping and slept on the ground? The first night is universally awful. There's no getting around it. But the next night is better, and after a couple more nights, I'm fine. What started as hard turns out to be not so bad as my body adjusts. But the other thing that happens when I embrace difficulty, and this is really fascinating to me, is that my creative energy fires up. My inner resources awaken and rise to the challenge, just like my body. Solving problems turns out to be a great way to engage my creativity. My best solutions have been born of painful necessity. Let me share a humbling example. Carving this sculpture, a mistake was made, and the base of the larger form had to be unexpectedly shortened. I was devastated. Ultimately, I grafted another stone to the sculpture using this unusual joint. The form, and more importantly, the metaphor, were expanded. The solution seems to suggest that we are standing on the shoulders of what came before. And of course, we always are. It's a stronger sculpture for the error and for the creativity it took to get to the solution. When I'm missing something I need to make a sculpture, my first impulse is to feel exasperated and think, I cannot proceed. But then I remember that the, some of the best works of civilization were created with the most basic of tools. Obstacles just like mine fired the creativity of ancient peoples to tolerances we struggle to match today. The Inca civilization had neither the wheel, iron tools, nor a written language. Yet they created these walls from hammer stones, not even chisels. From 10 ton blocks, they dragged five miles across a mountainous valley. The workmanship is so tight, you can't put paper between the joints. The walls so strong, they have survived more than 50 earthquakes over 6.0 on the Richter scale without losing a single stone. I only wish that I had designed and built them. The pyramids at Giza were built by ordinary people who placed by hand 800 tons of stone every day. Think of it, 800 tons, quarried, shaped, fabricated, moved to the site and installed. The needs of the project were so great, they had to first invent geometry. <laughs> Amazing. Earlier civilizations faced many of the same threats we face today. They had natural disasters and heartbreaking pandemics. They suffered social unrest and unstable political leadership. Creatively, they found ways to succeed. Listen, I'm, I'm not anti-technology, and I'm certainly not one of those pining away for a time before anesthesia. 
but I work every day not to let the promise of technology rob me of my own agency or creativity. I absolutely refuse for it to make me passive or afraid to try and accomplish really hard things over long periods of time. Technology is sexy and it seems to offer me shortcuts. But what I find is that it can also rob me of deeper expression and considered impact. I try to remember that my creativity is not device dependent. On the contrary, working more simply forces my creativity into play. It calls it forth, demands my full attention, and makes it part of my tool set. So let's try something. Let yourself dream of a project too big to complete in a single lifetime. Draw a sketch of your idea using paper. Build a simple model using popsicle sticks or, or cut it out of blocks of zucchini and stack it up. Tackle it with simple tools under imperfect conditions. Nurture that idea over weeks and then months. Chip away at it through the seasons. Do it the hard way. See how your body adjusts. First your body, then your soul, then your creative spirit. Things feel hard right now. These are times requiring our creativity. Thank you.